Hi, this is Ray Mossolder. You've been told that all things that are good come to an end, but that's not true. If you're a Christian, <laughs> all things that are good have just begun. You can't lose with the Christian life because either you're here with Christ ministering to you and leading you and guiding you and protecting you and helping you and even seeing loved ones around you who break your heart because they die, even seeing them to heaven waiting for you. <laughs> you can't lose if you're a Christian. We're in what I've held back for a little bit. We're in the 31st lesson with Christ in the School of Prayer by Andrew Murray, a 31-day study to gain a more, much more powerful prayer life. So let's get this going and see how Andrew brings this particular message to a conclusion. Boy, this smacks me hard. There have been days throughout my lifetime as a Christian when I haven't prayed. I wonder if that's true of you too. Now listen to the verse. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Always rejoice pray without ceasing in everything give thanks how much do you give thanks for the food you eat how much do you give thanks there was a book written years ago called how much prayer does a hamburger take <laughs> i love the title i'm like excuse me but i gotta walloping sense of humor. How much does it take? Because most people in a restaurant would be embarrassed to pray. Christians embarrassed to pray. They'd rather please the people around them than please the Lord. Many at home never pray over their food and yet they eat some of the greatest meals that man has known. Always rejoice. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. Our Lord told the parable of the widow and the unjust judge to teach us that men ought to pray. Always men, women, children, ought to pray always and not faint. Luke 18, 1 through 8. As the widow persevered in seeking one definite thing, the unjust judge chose to answer her. The parable appears to have reference to persevering prayer when God delays or appears to refuse. Now the words in the epistles, constant in prayer, Romans 12, 12, persevere in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, Colossians 4, 2, and praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, Ephesians 6, 18. Those appear to refer to the whole life being a one of prayer. As the soul is filled with a longing for the manifestation of God's glory to us, in us, through us, and around us, and with the confidence that he hears the prayers of his children, the inmost life of the soul is continually rising in dependence, faith, 
longing desire, and trustful expectation. At the close of our meditations, it won't be difficult to say what is needed to live such a life of prayer. The first thing is undoubtedly the entire submission of the life, your life, my life, to God and His glory. He who seeks to pray without ceasing because he wants to be pious and good like a Pharisee or Sadducee, they'll never attain it. It's the forgetting of self and the yielding ourselves to live for God and His honor that enlarges the heart. I don't mean an enlarged heart. <laughs> like you need surgery. Talking about being more and more filled with God. That teaches us to regard everything in the light of God and His will. And that instinctively recognizes that the need for God's help and blessing in everything around us is an opportunity for His being glorified. Everything is weighed and tested by the one thing that fills the heart, the glory of God, and the soul has learned that only what is of God can really be to Him and to His glory. So the whole life becomes a cry from the innermost heart for God to prove His power and love and to show forth His glory. The believer awakens to the consciousness that he is like one of the watchmen on Zion's walls, one of the Lord's remembrance, remembrancers, whose call touches and moves the king in heaven to do what he otherwise would not have done. He understands how real Paul's exhortation was to pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, for all the saints and for me, and praying also together for us. Now, Paul had a real privilege over you and me. Paul was in prison. What do you mean that's a real privilege? He had plenty of time to pray. Nothing else was in his mind but the Lord. And he wasn't necessarily praying. Do you read Philippians? He wasn't necessarily praying. I want out of here, please. In fact, he wasn't praying that way at all. He didn't mind being there if he was there for the Lord. And that's what he did. He was there for the Lord and he continually prayed. And I'm going to tell you, he had to have prayed in tongues as well as in English. He said, I pray in tongues more than you all. So he must have been praying in tongues to continue the prayer. Because I, I don't know about you, but I get tired of saying, even bless Georgia. I get tired of that because I think, don't you know that's what I said yesterday? What I said the day before? But when you pray in tongues, you don't know what you're praying. Your um, flesh is flesh, but your spirit is has the Holy Spirit in it if you're a Christian. And therefore, when you pray in tongues, God hears you. Well, how come your language sounds so different than mine? Well, why does a person in the Philippines sound different than a person in Malaysia? because they're two different countries. 
Well, does that mean in heaven there's going to be a lot of countries? No. No, we'll all be of one kind. But the fact is that when we reach heaven, that's when we will leave Andrew Murray behind. However, he'll be in heaven and we will begin hearing the teaching from the master himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if that brings up the idea of you with a harp on a cloud, and that's how you're going to spend eternity, just praising God with that harp, forget it. Isn't how it's going to be. But we will pray and we will understand prayer even more than we do today, which is shallow compared to what we will learn when we reach heaven. He understands how real Paul's exhortation was to pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Holy Spirit for all the saints and for me and praying also together for us to forget oneself and to live for God in his kingdom among men is the way to learn to pray without ceasing. This life devoted to God must be accompanied by the deep confidence that our prayer is effectual. We've seen how our blessed Lord insisted upon nothing as much as faith in the Father as a God who most certainly does just exactly what we ask. Ask and you shall receive. Be assured an answer is with him. It is the beginning and the end of his teaching. Compare Matthew 7, 8 and John 16, 24. As this assurance masters us and becomes a settled thing that God does what we ask, we dare not neglect the use of this wonderful power. The soul turns wholly to God and our life becomes prayer. The Lord needs and takes time because we and those around us are the creatures of time under the law of growth. Knowing that not one single prayer of faith can possibly be lost and that there's sometimes a need for the storing and the accumulating of prayer Preserving prayer becomes an irresistible, quiet, persistent living of our life of desire and faith in the presence of our God. Oh, don't let us limit and weaken such free and sure promises of the living God by robbing them of their power and ourselves of the wonderful confidence they're meant to inspire. Not in God, not in his secret will, not in the limitations of his promises, but in us, in ourselves, is the hindrance. We might not be what we should be to obtain the promise. So let's open our hearts to God's word of promise in all their simplicity and truth. They will search us and humble us. They will lift us up and make us glad and strong. And to the faith that knows it gets what it asks, prayer is not a work, it's not a burden, but a joy and triumph. It becomes a necess necessity and second nature. This union of strong desire and firm confidence is nothing but the life of the Holy Spirit within us. The Holy Spirit dwells in us, hides himself 
in the depths of our being and stirs the desire after the unseen and the divine one, after God himself. Now in groanings that can't be uttered, then is clear and conscious assurance. Now in special distinct petitions for the deeper revelation of Christ, then in pleadings for a soul, a work, the church, or the world. And those groanings that can't be uttered means there's something more than speaking in your own language. Something more than that. What is that? The heavenly language that God gives you in the language of tongues. Now, it is always only the Holy Spirit who draws the heart to thirst for God, to long for him to be made known and glorified. Now, do you really live to make Christ glorified? Is that your object when you're with friends or do you just get caught up in the daily chatter? When the child of God really lives and walks in the spirit, he's not content to remain carnal, but seeks to be spiritual as a fit organ for the spirit to reveal Christ. The eternal interceding life of the blessed Son who prays in us, our prayer must be heard. Because we pray in the Spirit, there's no need of time, patience, and continual renewing of the prayer. Now, let's look at that thought because I think in this final day of the teaching that Andrew Murray is doing now. Let's look at that and read it again. Because we pray in the Spirit. Now, praying in the Spirit is praying in tongues over and over. Just check your Bible. Don't believe me. Check your Bible. You'll see the very same thing. Singing in the Spirit praying in the Spirit. There is need of time to do that. There is need of patience to do that. And continual renewing of the prayer until every obstacle is conquered. And the harmony between God's Spirit and ours is perfect. When I pray, often and not always, I go through my prayer list. It's people that I absolutely want to pray for daily. My first wife right now has cancer of the lungs. They're using radiation to wipe it out. But I pray for her daily that she will be healed and that the radiation will do no harm to her. That's not a difficult prayer. I care for her. I pray for other people, my family, my kids, my grandkids, and then a whole bunch of other people who means so much to me. And I often look at their names and then I just begin to pray in tongues for them. Now, the eternal interceding life of the blessed Son of God will reveal and repeat itself in our experience because it is the Spirit of Christ who prays in us 
our prayer must be heard. Because we pray in the Spirit, there's no need of time, patience, and continual renewing of the prayer. If I'm praying in tongues, I don't have to say, I'm praying for this person. All I need to do is concentrate on Christ and then concentrate on the person and God hears me in tongues. Till every obstacle is conquered, and the harmony between God's spirit and ours is perfect. Does that mean I have to pray in tongues before God will hear me? No. No, it doesn't mean that. And I pointed out the greatest evangelist of the 20th century, Dr. Billy Graham. Yeah, absolutely, as far as I know, never spoke in tongues. So no, I'm not saying that. He certainly had his prayers heard. But what I am saying is there's a powerful force of prayer beyond the language that you know now. And tomorrow we can begin looking at the manual on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. At the end of this message, I'll tell you again how to get it downloaded. But the chief thing we need for such a life of unceasing prayer is to know that Jesus teaches us to pray. We've begun to understand a little of what his teaching is. He teaches not the communication of new thoughts, new views, not the discovery of failure or error, not the stirring up of desire and faith, but the including of us in the fellowship of his own prayer life before the Father. Now, let's see. There. This time, I've got it right. That's how he spent his early morning hours day after day while he was on earth. The chief thing is that we need for such a life of unceasing prayer is to know that Jesus teaches us to pray. And we'll understand it better by and by. We begin to understand a little of what his teaching is. He teaches not the communication of new thoughts or views, not the discovery of failure or error, not the stirring up of desire and faith, but the including of us in the fellowship of his own prayer life before the Father. The sight of the praying Jesus was what made the disciples ask to be taught to pray. The faith of the ever-praying Jesus, who alone has the power to pray, teaches us to pray. We know why. He who prays is our head in our life. All he has is ours and is given to us when we give ourselves all the way to him. That, again, I'm going to say it because it's so important you get this. Doesn't mean you have to go overseas and be a missionary. Doesn't mean that you have to be the pastor of a church. But there's work at the church that needs to be done that you can take part of. Whether it's counseling, if you know the word backward, forward, and sideways. Somebody said, I only know it sideways. Well, that's not enough. The inner sanctuary is our home where we dwell. And he that lives near God and knows that he has been brought near to bless those who are far away cannot but pray. Christ makes us partakers with himself in his prayer power and in his prayer life. 
We understand then that our true aim must not be to work much and have prayer enough to keep the work right, but to pray much and then to work enough for the power and blessing obtained in prayer to find its way through us to men, women, teenagers, children. Christ lives forever to pray. He saves and reigns. He communicates his prayer life to us. He maintains in it, it, it he maintains it in us if we trust him. He's a guarantee for our praying without ceasing. Yes, Christ teaches us to pray by showing how he does it, by doing it in us, and by leading us to do it in him and like him. Christ is the life and the strength for a never ceasing prayer life. It's the sight of this, the sight of the praying Christ as our life that enables us to pray without ceasing because his priesthood is the power of an endless life that resurrection life that never fades and never fails and because his life is our life praying without ceasing can become nothing less than the joy of heaven to us not work not by works that you'll be saved but by your faith this isn't works to pray. So the apostle said, always rejoice, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. Supported by never ceasing joy and never ceasing praise, never ceasing prayer is the manifestation of the power of the eternal life where Jesus always prays. The union between the vine and the branch. You take a vine, you take a branch. Is indeed a prayer union. The highest conformity to Christ. And most blessed participation in the glory of his heavenly life. Is that we take part in his work of intercession. Together with him. We live forever to pray in the experience of our union with him. Praying without ceasing becomes a possibility, a reality, and the holiest and most blessed part of our holy and blessed fellowship with God. We have our dwelling within the veil in the presence of the Father, in the Holy of Holies. To think that you and I, mortal people, can sit or stand or be on our knees before the living God. It's too much to consume. What the Father says, we do. And that's the Bible. And if he speaks to us, we're obedient. What the Son says, the Father does. Praying without ceasing is the earthly manifestation of heaven come down to us. The foretaste of the life where they rest not day or night in the song of worship and adoration. Would you pray with me? Oh, my Father, I pray you're not going to have to repeat this after I pray, or uh, this is Andrew Murray's writing, but it is prayer. 
Oh, my Father, I praise you with my whole heart for this wondrous life of never-ceasing prayer, never-ceasing fellowship, never-ceasing answers, and never-ceasing experience of my oneness with him who forever lives to pray. Oh, my God, keep me dwelling and walking in the presence of your glory so that prayer may be the spontaneous expression of my life with you. Bless Savior, I praise you with my whole heart that you came from heaven to share with me in my needs and in my cries that I might share with you in your all-prevailing intercession. And I thank you that you've taken me into the school of prayer to teach the blessedness and the power of the life that is in prayer. And most of all, that you've taken me into the fellowship of your life of intercession. And through me, your blessings may be given to those around me. Holy Spirit, with deep reverence, I thank you for your work in me. It's through you that I share in the communication between the Son and the Father and enter into the fellowship of the life and love of the Holy Trinity. Spirit of God, perfect your work in me. Bring me into a perfect union with Christ, my intercessor. And let my life become one that's always to the glory of the Father and to the blessing of those around me. You, who surround me in 191 countries, you mean so much to me. And I pray for God to continue to bless you. Amen. Now here's a note. George Mueller and the secret of his power in prayer. When God wishes to teach his church, church a truth, that's not being understood or practiced. He mostly does so by raising some men to be in the word and deed, a living witness to its bless to his blessedness and to prayer's blessedness. So God raised up a man named George Miller. It's actually Mueller and others in the 19th century to be his witnesses that he's indeed the hearer of prayer. I know of no way in which the principal truths of God's word about prayer can be more effectually illustrated and established than with a short review of his life and what he tells us of his prayer experiences. I'm going to stop there for just a moment. After a while, in a few months, I'm going to be giving you the teaching of Smith Wigglesworth. Now, I agree that's a very funny name, Wigglesworth. But what he did wasn't funny. He had a prayer life that, well... My best illustration is the group of pastors who gathered around him one day while he was praying. And the Holy Spirit's anointing was so thick that these pastors couldn't stand it. And one by one, they crept out of the room too strong 
just right in God's mind. And certainly they were so impressed, but that wasn't Miller's reason for doing it. Let's look at this. I've not read it either, and I'm eager to read it. Mueller was born in Prussia on September 27, 1805, and is thus now 80 years of age at this writing. <laughs> It'll tell you how old Andrew Murray was. His early life, even after entering the University of Hale as a theological student, was wicked in the extreme. But when just 20 years old, a friend took him to a prayer meeting one evening. He was deeply impressed and soon after came to know the Savior. Not long after, he began reading missionary papers and in the course of time, he offered himself to the London Society for promoting Christianity amongst the Jews. He was accepted as a student, but soon found that he couldn't submit to the rules of the society in all things because it left too little liberty for the leading of the Holy Spirit. The affiliation was dissolved in 1830 by mutual consent and he became the pastor of a small congregation at Tynemouth. In 1832, he was led to Bristol and as pastor of Bethesda Chapel, he was led to the Orphan House and other works where God has remarkably led him. And now he was still living at the time this was being written long since in heaven. He was led to the orphan house and in other works where God has remarkably led him to trust his word and experience how he fulfills that word. A few excerpts about his spiritual life will prepare the way for what we wish to quote of his experiences in reference to prayer. In connection with this, I mentioned that the Lord graciously gave me a measure of simplicity and of childlike disposition in spiritual things from the commencement of my divine life. While I was exceedingly ignorant of the scriptures and still from time to time overcome even by outward sins, yet I was enabled to carry most minute matters to the Lord in prayer. I found godliness as profitable in all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. 1 Timothy 4, 8. Though very weak and ignorant, yet I had by the grace of God some desire to benefit others. And he who so faithfully had once served Satan sought now to win souls for Christ. It was at Tainmouth that he learned how to use God's word and trust the Holy Spirit as the teacher given by God to make that word clear. He writes, quote, God then began to show me that the word of God alone is our standard of judgment in spiritual things, that it can be explained only by the Holy Spirit and that in our day as well as in former times, he's the teacher of his people. I hadn't experientially understood the office of the Holy Spirit before that time. My beginning to understand this latter point in particular had a great effect on me. 
For the Lord enabled me to put it to the test of experience by laying aside commentaries and most other books and simply reading and studying the Word of God, the Bible. The result of this was that the first evening I shut myself into my room to give myself to prayer and meditation over the scriptures. And I learned more in a few hours than I had done during a period of several months previously. But the particular difference was that I received real strength for my soul in doing this. I now began to test with the scriptures the things that I'd learned and seen. And I found that only those principles that stood the test were of real value. On obedience to the word of God, he writes as follows in connection with his being baptized. It had pleased God in his abundant mercy to bring my mind into such a state that I was willing to carry out whatever I should find in the scriptures. I could say, I will do his will. And because of this, I believe that I saw which doctrine of God I would observe here. And by the way, the passage to which I've just alluded has been most remarkable for me on many doctrines and precepts of our most holy faith. For instance, resist not with evil, but whoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone desires to sue thee at the law and take away thy clothing, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him two, two miles. Give to him that asks of thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Love your enemies. Bless those that curse you. Do good to those that hate you. And pray for those who speak evil about you and persecute you. Matthew 5, 39 through 44. Sell what you have and give alms. Luke 12, 33. Owe no one anything but love one but love one unto another. Romans 13, 8. It may be said, surely the passages can't be taken literally. For then would the people of God be able to survive in the world? The state of mind of John 7.17 will cause such objections to vanish. That's where it says, if anyone desires to do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it's of God or whether I speak of myself. I believe that whoever is willing to act out these commandments of the Lord literally will be led with me to see that taking them literally is the will of God. Those who do so will doubtlessly often be brought into difficulties which are hard to bear. These will have a tendency to make them feel that they're strangers and pilgrims here on earth, that this world is not their home, and thus to throw them more upon God, who will assuredly help us through any difficulty into which we may be brought by seeking to act in obedience to his word. 
This implicit surrender to God's word led Mueller to certain views and conduct in regard to money, which mightily influenced his future life. They had their root in the conviction that money was a divine stewardship and that all money had to be received and dispensed in direct fellowship and that all money had to be uh, with God himself. This led him to adopting the following four great rules. One, not to receive any fixed salary, both because in the collecting of it, there was often much that was at variance with the free will offering which God's service, with which God's service is to be maintained. And in the receiving of it, there was a danger of placing more dependence on human sources of income than on the living God himself. Uh, churches as great as Gateway in South Lake, Texas, which is a mega church, has, can, uh, I don't know what you'd call them, coin collectors <laughs> in the back on um, little boxes where you can put your offering, but no formal offering taken. At least that's what it was like the last time I was there, which was probably mm, at least five years ago. Second, never, to, and by the way, a lot of four square churches, which my brother, my brother, which my son, Tim, pastors, and is available for seeing on YouTube. Um, they take offerings the regular way. But a workman is worthy of their hire. Never to ask, a second, never to ask any human being for help however great the need might be, but to make his wants known to the God who has promised to care for his servants and to hear their prayer. Three, to take the command to sell what you have and give alms literally and never save up money, but spend all that God entrusted on him on God is poor for the work of his kingdom. And four, to take Romans 13, 8, owe no one anything, literally, and never buy on credit or be in debt for anything, but to trust God to provide. Now this manner of living was uneasy at first, Mueller testifies it was most blessed in bringing the soul to rest in God and drawing it into closer union with him when he was inclined to backslide. Here's his quote, for it will not do. It's not possible to live in sin and at the same time by communion with God to draw from heaven everything one needs for the present life. Not long after his settlement at Bristol, the Scriptural Knowledge Institution for Home and Abroad was established for aiding in day school, Sunday school, and mission and Bible work. And from this institution, the orphan housework, for which Mr. Mueller is best known, became a branch. It was in 1834 that his heart was touched by the case of an orphan brought to Christ 
in one of the schools. The child had to go to a poorhouse where his spiritual needs wouldn't be cared for. Meeting shortly after, he writes on November 20th, 1835, Today, I've had it very much laid on my heart, no longer merely to think about the establishment of an orphan home, but actually to set it about it, to set about it. And I've been very much in prayer respecting it in order to ascertain the Lord's mind. May God make it plain. And again on November 25th of that year, he wrote, I have begun again much in prayer yesterday and today about the orphan home and am more and more convinced that it is of God. May he in mercy guide me. The three chief reasons are one, that God may be glorified if he's pleased to furnish me with the means as it is seen that it is not a vain thing to trust him so the faith of his children may be strengthened. Two, the spiritual welfare of fatherless and motherless children. And three, their temporal welfare, temporal meaning the material needs that they have. After months of prayer and waiting on God, a house was rented with room for 30 children. And in the course of time, three more houses were rented, housing 120 children in all. The work was carried on this way for 10 years. The supplies of the needs of the orphans was asked and received of God alone. In other words, he wasn't putting out the announcements that he needed financial help, just told God. Often it was a time of sore need and much prayer, but it became a trial of faith more precious than gold under praise and honor and the glory of God. The Lord was preparing his servant for greater things, but his providence and his Holy Spirit, Mr. Mueller was led to desire and wait upon God until he received the sure promise of 15 pounds sterling British currency from him for a home to house 300 children. The first home was opened in 1849. In 1858, a second and a third home for 950 orphans were opened, costing 35,000 pounds. And in 1869 and 1870, a fourth and fifth home for 850 or more children opened at an expense of 50,000 pounds, making the total number of the orphans 2,100. In addition to this work, God has given him almost as much for other work, the support of schools and missions and Bible and tract circulation. As for the buildings of the orphans' homes, and the maintenance of the orphans in all is received from God to be spent in his work during these 50 years, more than one million pounds sterling. Now little he knew that when he gave up his salary of 30 pounds a year in obedience to the Lord God's word and Holy Spirit, God was preparing him the reward for obedience and faith. Now wonderfully the word was fulfilled to him. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will set thee over many things. Matthew 25, 
23. And these things have happened for an example to us. God calls us to be followers of George Mueller, even as he is of Christ. His God is our God. The same promises are for us. The same service of love and faith in which he labored is calling for us on every side. Let us study in our lessons the way God gave George Mueller a power as a man of prayer. We shall find the most remarkable illustration of some of the lessons which we've been studying with a blessed master in the word. We shall have impressed upon us his first great lesson, that if we will come to him in the way he has pointed out with definite petitions, made known to us by the Spirit through the Word according to the will of God, we may most confidently believe that whatsoever we shall ask will be done. Now there's a final note, prayer and the word of God. We have more than once seen that God's listening to a voice depends on our listening to his voice. We mustn't only have a special promise to plead when we make a special request, but also our whole life must be under the supremacy of the word. The word must be dwelling in us. The testimony of George Mueller on this point is most instructive. He tells us how the discovery of the true place of the word of God and the teaching of the spirit was the commencement of a new era in his spiritual life. He writes, now the scripture way of reasoning would have been, God has condescended to become an author, and I'm ignorant about that precious book, which his Holy Spirit has caused to be written through the instrumentality of his servants. It contains what I ought to know and the knowledge of what will lead me to true happiness. Therefore, I ought to read again and again this most precious book, this book of books, most earnestly, most prayerfully, and with much meditation. I to continue this practice all the days of my life. For I was aware that I knew scarcely anything of it, because I only read a little. But instead of acting and being led by my ignorance of the word of God to study it more, my difficulty in understanding it and the little enjoyment I had in it made me careless about reading it. For much prayerful reading of the word gives us not merely more knowledge, but also increases the delight we have in reading it. Thus, like many believers, for the first four years of my divine life, I practically preferred the works of uninspired men to the oracles of the living God. The consequence was that I remained a baby, both in knowledge and grace. In knowledge, I say, for all true knowledge, must be derived by the Spirit from the Word. And as I neglected the Word, I was so ignorant for nearly four years that I didn't clearly know even the fundamental points of our holy faith. And this lack of knowledge most sadly kept me back from walking steadily in the ways of God. For when it pleased the Lord in August 1829 
to bring me to the scriptures. My life and walk became very different. And though ever since I've fallen short of what I might and ought to be, yet by the grace of God, I've been enabled to live much nearer to him than before. If any believers read this, who practically prefer other books to the Holy Scriptures and enjoy the writings of men and women much more than the Word of God, may they be warned by my loss. I should consider this book to have been the means of doing much good if through it some of his people no longer neglect the Holy Scriptures but give them preference, which they've given to the writings of men before. Now, before I leave this subject, I'd only add that if the reader understands very little of the Word of God, he ought to read it very often, for the Spirit explains the Word by the Word. And if he enjoys the reading of the word a little, that's the reason he should read it much. For the frequent reading of the scriptures creates a delight in them. The more we read them, the more we desire to do so. Above all, he should seek to have it settled in his own mind or her own mind that God alone by his spirit can teach them. And therefore, as they ask for blessings, it serves them to seek God's blessings prior to reading and while reading. He should have it moreover settled in his mind that although the Holy Spirit is the best and sufficient teacher, Yet this teacher doesn't always teach immediately when we desire it. Therefore, we may have to entreat him again and again for the explanation of certain passages. But he'll surely teach us at last, if indeed we're seeking for light, prayerfully, patiently, and with a view to the glory of God. We find in Mueller's journal frequent mention made of his spending two or three hours in prayer over the word for the feeding of his spiritual life. As a fruit of this, when he had need of strength and encouragement in prayer, the individual promises were not many arguments from a book to be used with God but living words which he heard the Father's living voice speak to him and which he could now bring to the Father in living faith. Prayer and the will of God. One of the greatest difficulties for young believers is to know how they can find out whether what they desire is according to God's will. I count it one of the most precious lessons of God that he wants to teach through the experience of George Mueller that he's willing to make known things his word says nothing about, that they are his will for us and that we may ask them. The teaching of the Spirit, not without or against the word, but as something above and beyond it, and in addition to it, without which we can't see God's will, is the heritage of every believer, is through the Word and the Word alone that the Spirit teaches, applying the general principles or promises to our very special need. And it is the Spirit and the Spirit alone who can make the Word a light on our path 
whether it's the path of duty in our daily walk or the path of faith in our approach to God. Let's try to notice in what childlike simplicity and teachableness it was that the discovery of God's will was made known to his servant. And with regard to the building of the first home and the assurance he had of its being God's will, Mueller writes in May 1850, just after it had been opened, speaking of the great difficulties there were, now little likely it appeared that they would be removed. Quote, but while the prospect before me would have been overwhelming had I looked at it naturally, I was never even for once permitted to question how it would end. For as from the beginning, I was sure it was the will of God that I should build this large orphan home for him. So also from the beginning, I was certain that the whole would be finished as if the home had already been fulfilled and the home filled with orphans. The way in which he found out what was God's will comes out with special clearness in his account of the building of the second home. I ask the reader to study with care the lesson the narrative conveys. December 5th, 1850. Under these circumstances, I can only pray that the Lord in his tender mercy would not allow Satan to gain an advantage over me. By the grace of God, my heart says, Lord, if I could be sure that it is your will that I go forward in this matter, I would do so cheerfully. On the other hand, if I could know that these are vain, foolish, proud thoughts and not from you, I would, by your grace, hate them and entirely put them aside. My hope is in God. He will help and teach me. Judging, however, from his former dealings with me, it would not be a strange thing to me, nor surprising, if he called me to labor still more in this way. The thoughts about enlarging the orphan work have not come from an abundance of money that has come in. I've had to wait upon God for about seven weeks, while little, very little comparatively, came in. About four times as much was going out as coming in. If the Lord had not previously sent me large sums, we would have been distressed. Lord, how can your servant know your will in this matter? Will you be pleased to teach him? December 11. During the last six days since writing the above, I've been waiting upon God day after day concerning this matter. It's generally been more or less on my heart all day long. When I've been awake at night, it's not been far from my thoughts. Yet all this has been without the least anxiety. I'm perfectly calm and quiet, respecting it. My soul would be rejoiced to go forward in this service, if I could be sure that the Lord would have me do so. For then, notwithstanding the numberless difficulties, all would be well, and his name would be magnified. On the other hand, if I were assured that the Lord would have me be satisfied with my present sphere of service, 
I wouldn't pray about enlarging the work. And by his grace, I could cheerfully do it without any effort. He has brought me into such a state of heart that I only desire to please him in this matter. Moreover, until now, I've not spoken about this thing, even to my beloved wife, the sharer of my joys, sorrows, and labors for more than 20 years. Nor is it likely that I shall do so for some time to come. For I prefer to wait on the Lord quietly without discussing this subject in order that I may be kept more easily by his blessing from being influenced by things from without. The burden of my prayer concerning the matter is that the Lord would not allow me to make a mistake and that he would teach me his will. December 26th. Fifteen days have elapsed since I wrote the preceding paragraph. Every day since then, I've continued to pray about this matter with a good measure of earnestness by the help of God. There's scarcely been a time during these days when this matter hasn't been more or less before me in my waking hours. But this is all without even a shadow of anxiety. I converse with no one about it. Till now I've not even done so with my dear wife. On the other hand, I would set to work tomorrow if the Lord bid me to do so. This calmness of mine, this having no will of my own in the matter, this only wishing to please my Heavenly Father in it, this seeking His and not my honor in it, this state of heart, I see as the fullest assurance to me that my heart is not under a fleshly excitement. And if I am helped thus to go on, I shall know the will of God to the full. But while I write this, I cannot help but add at the same time that I do crave the honor and the glorious privilege to be more and more used by the Lord. I desire to be allowed to provide scriptural instruction for a thousand orphans instead of doing so for 300. I desire to expound the Holy Scriptures regularly to a thousand orphans instead of doing so for 300. I desire that it may be more abundantly manifested that God is still the hearer and answerer of prayer. And he's the living God now as he always was and ever will be. When he simply answers my prayer to provide me with a house for 700 orphans and means to support them. The last, this last consideration is the most important point in my mind. The Lord's honor <coughs> is the principal point with me in this whole matter. <coughs> And because this is the case, if he would be more glorified by not going forward in this business by his grace, I'd be perfectly content to give up all thoughts about another orphan house. Surely, in such a state of mind, <coughs> obtained by the Holy Spirit, you, O oh my heavenly Father, will not allow your child, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going through a tissy fit here. Surely in such a state of mind, 
obtained by the Holy Spirit, you, O oh my Heavenly Father, will not allow your child to be mistaken, much less deluded. By the help of God, I shall continue further day by day to wait upon him in prayer <coughs> concerning this thing until he shall bid me to act. Now this is Ray. I'd love to finish this, but I don't know how long it goes. And again, I never read ahead. So I'm going to stop it there, but I want you to understand that you've caught the very essence of what he is saying. <clears throat> Maybe that coughing was just a signal that I should stop. But God answers prayer. Those like, and I mentioned him so often, Bill Johnson, who, by the way, his wife's name is not uh, Darlene. That was his mother. His wife's name is Benny. Benny. And uh, they participate in this long train. It is astounding, astounding what Bill has accomplished. What Christ, I should say, because he'd be the first to correct me, through Christ, who has done a work. And now the Bethel churches are springing up all over America. Look for one near you. I couldn't commend it more. I find it amazing. Miracles happening every day. Every day. Seven days a week. And this praying going on like George Mueller's prayers are accomplishing their work. And Bill and Benny would be the last to vainly talk about it. But it is astounding. So I will be back to finish this and then start the new book that will replace it. What will that be? It's actually a manual. And the manual is the manual written by Dave Chrisman. He also goes by the name Hugh Chrisman. And it is a book on the baptism in the Holy Spirit, a manual on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. When you go to reachmornow.com, then don't go on to the videos. But on that first page, look to your left, and you'll see the baptism in the Holy Spirit written just down there, right toward the top. Then download it, and we will get to it. And I will start it the second time I come back to this. But I'm going to finish this uh, next time. I hope you've enjoyed it. Gosh, George Mueller. The Mueller report of today was nothing like George Mueller's report on God. <laughs>